Today, October 4th, 2017, and it's currently 105. I do apologize uh, for my tardiness of five minutes to get this committee going. Can we have a roll call, please? Calling the roll, Ms. Conwell? Here. Mr. Tuma? Here. Ms. Baker? Here. Ms. Brown? Here. Mr. Miller? Mr. Miller is absent at the moment. There is a quorum. And Mr. Miller will be excused. I'd like to make a motion to excuse Mr. Miller. He is working currently on the on the budget right I'll now. I'll second that. All right. All in favor say aye. 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 So I have a question, a few questions from Mr. Miller um, that we will ask. He made sure that he was covered one way or the other. So any public comment related to the agenda, Madam Chair? Uh, Madam no, Clark. Madam Chair. All right. Approval of the minutes. Everyone was here from the September 20th meeting. Can I have a motion to approve the minutes? Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Minutes from September 20th meeting have been approved. Matters referred to the committee. There is one item today. And uh, can you please read the item into the record, please? Resolution number 2017-0165. <clears throat> authorizing an amendment to contract number CE1700154 with Case Western Reserve University for fiscal agent services in connection with facilitation of the first year Cleveland initiative for the period 6-1-2016 through 4-30-2019 to expand the scope of services affected 4-1-2017 and for additional funds. And Mr. Carroll, are you presenting to us today? Yes, sir. After, afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh, thank you. Excellent. For the county to um, have funds dispersed to Case Western School of Medicine, that, who has been serving as the fiscal agent for the nonprofit organization for uh, for a little while now, uh, this uh, also the contract involves the city of Cleveland's funds as well that are also being conveyed to uh, to Case Western. Uh, so today, uh, our executive director of First Year Cleveland and um, Case Western Reserve leaders who are an important part of the project, and Michael Hauser also from the executive's office, uh, are prepared to speak and uh, answer your questions about what First Year Cleveland is, a little bit about how it came to be. Uh, I think uh, you know, there's a lot of detail to present, but I think the, the idea is to try to answer your questions and focus on the topics that, that this committee is interested in. Uh, but we're, we're happy to do that. Um, I'd be happy to turn it over to our presenters or be happy to just start with questions about the particular legislation at this time. Thank you. Whatever you prefer, uh, Madam Chair. Um, um, we'd have a, like to have a little background from Case. And you know, I know great. Case is going to be the fiscal agent only, correct? Uh, what about the director for first year Cleveland? It's right. So that's great. So I think Bernie Kerrigan is prepared to uh, do the presentation and include the case uh, representatives and Michael. Yes, please. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. State your name for the record, please. My name is Bernadette Kerrigan. I'm executive director of First Year at Cleveland and apologize that I have an upper respiratory infection, but this um, topic is um, an important one and we um, really greatly appreciate the opportunity as um, founders and funders of First Year Cleveland, we are thrilled to have the opportunity to talk to you today about our progress and to answer your questions. And your, can you spell your last name for me, please? Sure. It's K-E-R-R-I-G-A-N. Thank you. Um, just wanted to make sure each of you had our handouts because we will be following those. My um, goal today is to give you background information making sure then you understand the problem um, that we are facing of our babies dying in our community, the solution that First Year Cleveland, a public-private par partnership is bringing, collective impact, um, the role, important role cases bring to the table and answer any questions about the operating expenses, and then we'll close with closing remarks. Okay, if you could just hold up whatever so we can follow along. We don't have this on the monitor. Sure, I guess first I um, would like to introduce myself. It's in the back on your left-hand side is um, my bio. I've had a long history um, in this community working on public-private partnerships, and it was an honor to be hired for this position. Couldn't think of anything more important to work with you and as a founder to um, solve the problem of our babies dying. 
For over four decades, we've had the highest rate of infant deaths in our country. And I will be following the report on your left-hand side. It is an executive report um, on that, or it's actually in the right hand of your folder. And we will stop um, and double checking in with you of any questions you have. As you know, each year our community has at least five kindergarten classrooms of infants dying before celebrating their first birthday. That's right here in Cuyahoga County. In the past, the rate has been three times as many as African-American babies dying as Caucasian. And unfortunately, we are only getting worse. I will be going over our 217 numbers where that number is actually, the um, disparity is even getting larger. Our community is grateful that you as founders and others have decided to go a new course of action. On December 30th, 215, Cuyahoga County civic leaders, including you guys, actually were key in finding um, or being a founder of First Year Cleveland. As I mentioned to you, we are a public-private partnership working together and looking at this issue from a different perspective. We are a data-informed community focused on making a collective impact to reduce our infants dying, particularly among African-American babies. There was a competitive RFP process in April 2016. Case Western Reserve School of Medicine was selected as the fiscal agent. You'll hear they're playing even a larger role for us with a three-year contract with the Cuyahoga County and the cities. Its duties include grants and contracts, grant reporting, fiscal management for the receipts of first-year Cleveland funds. As of September 30th, 2017, Case has already generously provided over $200,000 of in-kind contributions with a three-person leadership team. You will meet two out of the three today and be able to hear their perspective and also answer questions. I am pleased that following an extensive search led by Natoya Walker Minor, the Chief of Public Affairs for the City of Cleveland, I was selected as the inaugural Executive Director hired in late November 2016. Under the leadership of City Council President Kevin Kelly, Cuyahoga County Executive Armand Budish, over now 230 organizations and individuals have joined First Year Cleveland. They have pledged to work together to stop our babies from dying. Our advisory roster, which is in your package, includes parents, government agencies, healthcare providers, philanthropic, educational institutions, community, faith-based leaders. We're all pledging to go under the umbrella of First Year Cleveland to lower the rate of infant mortality from 10.5, which we faced um, in 2015, to getting it to the national average of six deaths per 1,000 babies by 220. I would appreciate if you would take out the roster so you can see some of you here at the table have been actively involved. We hope others may want to join us, but you will see a list. It's a great depth and breadth of our community. Can you show us what that looks like? Sure. I will need to grab it out of my thing at the end. I apologize. Um, oh, um, is it? Thank you. Um, it's always nice to have a partner in crime um, on that. So if you look at the Community Advisory Council Charter, it looks like this. It tells you a little about the purpose, okay. our direction, our metrics, and right behind it are all the um, Community Advisory Council members as of date. We have 231 um, daily. I get phone calls of people wanting to come to the table to learn more about this topic and how they can be active. What's unique about this is that we are asking people for their time, talent, and treasure. It is very important this community, community does not duplicate efforts that are already in play. But what we need to do is one plus one must equal four. No longer can we play off, um, we have to get on the same page and move the needle. Um, this can be difficult, this is messy work, and in my closing remarks I'll tell you it's messy work. Um, we are on purpose trying to be a little disruptive, that our babies are dying and there are some things we can be doing if we stay collective and we stay disciplined. I'd like to talk a little to you about the problem so you understand what we're facing here. 
Cuyahoga County has the highest infant mortality rate in our state. This has been um, the same for now 47 years. Let me repeat, 47 years, Cuyahoga County has had the largest infant mortality rate in the state. So we are not gonna solve this problem in my nine months. We have a dedication of being in this for the marathon, but we do feel you need to see results quickly and we think we can provide them for you. Since the 1960s, there's been three major efforts to reduce infant mortality in our region, primarily using a neighborhood-based social service intervention strategy. There has been tremendous improvements in this model. It has improved our access to high quality prenatal care. I did put in your folder, and let me pull it out for you. It looks like this. We are getting phone calls from major cities, small towns in Ohio. How, do, how did we improve people getting to prenatal care? We have the best rate of prenatal care access and attendance in the state. And we should applaud the agencies that have worked very hard. But what we have realized the hard way is access to prenatal care, even when it's high quality, will not be the only solution we can bring to the table to lower the number of babies dying. Let's walk through why our babies are dying. I think the best way is to start looking at the storyboard. It looks like this, just so. It is also, if you want to compare 215 to 216, if you were be kind enough, go to our strategic plan, go to the appendix in our strategic plan, and there's a 215 storyboard called Appendix C. And I would appreciate you pulling that out and pulling out the 216, and this also has 217 data, so we can thoroughly discuss, so there are no surprises to you why our babies are dying. Everyone find it. The primary cause of our babies dying is extreme prematurity. It is not the limited amount of access to prenatal care. It is not drug and alcohol abuse. It is not domestic violence or many of the other things we might have had some assumptions in the past. In 215, 70, or 45% of all infant deaths were born to extreme premature, 22 weeks gestation or earlier. 70% of all premature infant deaths in 215 were African American babies. The majority of these moms who suffered losses had significant interaction with the medical providers. Another surprise, 50% of them were private insurance self-pay, not Medicaid. There was many assumptions that it was poor babies from the African American communities dying. The research and the data is clear. Racial disparities are happening across all incomes and all education. Following extreme prematurity, our next is sleep-related. This is preventable sleep-related deaths on this. These are moms who are co-sleeping with babies, and they're rolling over their babies and unintentionally suffocating. We are asking today for this community to come together. We think we have a solution to activating this entire community in ensuring that no baby that is preventable sleep-related deaths is put in this kind of risk. The babies that are dying from preventable sleep-related death are babies going home after delivery healthy. To be honest, I was a social worker, a perinatal social worker. If you had asked me, I would have thought a lot of the sleep-related deaths were baby that were maybe premature, had limited respiratory system issues, and there was a tie-in. None of the babies that had died in 215, 216 from sleep-related, preventable sleep-related deaths were actually NICU babies. These are the healthiest babies going home. The death is typically happening from 8 to 12 weeks, and it is unintentional from co-sleeping, 60%, or 40% being in a crib, a pack-and-play, a box, however, using multiple blankets, pillows, and things like that. Probably by six months, most of our babies have neck movement that they can move away when they're in a situation of distress. Unfortunately, before six months, there is no movement. So if a blanket or a stuffed animal or other things gets in the way of our baby's breathing before six months, um, they are put at severe risk. The last thing I'd like to share of the research before we move on to the solutions of sleep-related is we have seen a tie-in of the issue of smoking. 
I don't think it's um, a coincidence that in 216, all the babies who died from preventable sleep-related deaths actually had firsthand or secondhand smoke going on in the home. It is why our community is going to move forward to the ABCDs. Alone, on the back, in a crib, pack and play, anywhere you feel a safe box, but don't smoke. Many mothers are not hearing that message that first or secondhand smoke does seem to be impacting babies um, that are dying from preventable sleep-related deaths. When you look at the storyboard we put together on the 216, I thought you might be interested to know the zip codes, the highest zip code areas, so you do have that in your storyboard. This surprises many people that Euclid, Shaker Heights, Garfield Heights are in your top three. You also then go to Broadway, Old Brooklyn, Cuyahoga Valley, Shaker Heights, Beachwood, Highland Heights, Cleveland, Warrensville Heights, Rocky River, Kinsman, Buck, Buckeye, Wood Hills, Central, Mount Pleasant. The reason I point this out is many people have done interventions more in the city. This we must look as a county issue, and that's why your leadership is invaluable to us. In 2016, we did drop infant mortality, and you will see a press article that is here that we did go from 10.5 to our new number, and let me get it correctly here, 8.6. That is showing some progress. You will see right now we are at 8.3. So for 217, unaudited, um, we're excited. This is our first time our community is starting to see monthly data, but the disparities of African American actually is going up. We'll spend a little more time on that in a few minutes. But I did want to point out that even way before First Year Cleveland was created, we have our community starting to address this. What First Year Cleveland is able to do is accelerate the learnings, be a lot more collaborative and strategic, in making sure when something's not working, we can stop it immediately, and what is seeming to work, that we can get it to scale. Before I go into the solution, I will stop there and making sure you have any questions on the problem, which the storyboard, our strategic plan, and the maps we provided you may assist. Any questions? <laughs> Councilwoman Baker. Um, just on a couple of um, remarks that you've made. The um, prematurity, which I believe you say is the highest reason for infant mortality. That is correct. So um, what are the causes for prematurity? Is it the, uh, well, I'll just let you answer. What is the causes for prematurity? Sure. There's lots of different reasons for prematurity. And what's unique that we want to point out here is this community has done extremely well over the last 30 years to address the issue of prematurity of what typically people think of as 27 weeks and down. Um, the leading cause of prematurity has been a mixture, obesity, diabetes, poor prenatal care. Um, we've had some drug and alcohol issues that does cause um, prematurity on the body going. Of course, we have some that with birth defects, um, on there. So there is multiple causes. What's catching our eye, though, is if you see through the storyboard, and if we particularly spend time on the 215 storyboard that's in the strategic plan, Appendix C, 70 out of 87 premature were premature under 23 weeks. That means we only lost 17 babies out of 14,844 that were 24 weeks and above. If we can get babies to stay in the womb to 24 weeks, you don't have a better town, to be honest, in this country between our leading hospitals and our NICU systems. What we need is to keep these babies in the womb longer. And when they stay to 24 weeks, we'd much rather them go all the way to full term. But when we get them past 24 weeks, our survival rate is better than Columbus, Cincinnati, and other major cities. So we want to figure out how to keep the baby in the womb longer. We're looking at two options. The first is a medical option. It's called 17P. It's progestogen. 
It does require a progesterone shot on a weekly basis. You must start it within the first trimester, and you do it all the way up to delivery time. Progesterone has been found at the level that 17P is to keep the baby in the womb longer. And that's what we need. The baby needs to be in the womb longer on that. However, we do also think that other interventions could be going on. Number one, structural racism. And we don't say that lightly, but we have talked and interviewed enough women and looked at the research that what is going on unique about the African-American woman that her body is having extreme prematurity. It is not the African-American body itself. That African-American body can carry babies. There's nothing. I've had people ask what I think are crazy questions, kind of what's wrong with their body, what's this or that. There is nothing. They are actually high medical compliancy. So we are looking at what is going on when they're interacting with the environment that may be causing some of this extreme stress that is actually causing this extreme prematurity. We have lots to learn. We do have a work plan here to begin um, tackling that issue on it. So I think we're going to have not only a medical um, intervention, but I think long term we have to find a way to have candid conversations about structural racism. Our leadership here, and we hope you join us, are planning to attend a racial equity institute to become more aware of how structural racism, policies, and procedures are unconsciously, unintentionally impacting our baby's poor health outcomes. Um, just a follow-up. Follow up. Um, putting that aside, because that is um, a little different than, than my question, um, the prematurity of 22 weeks to 24 weeks, 24 weeks is the number you want to reach, is that right? We want to reach 40 weeks, to be honest, but 24 weeks makes a huge difference between 22 and 24 weeks. So we do really, I'm being very clear, full-term babies, healthy babies is the goal. However, for viability, getting to the 24 weeks in this town gives us a lot better odds. But those babies are living but have long-term issues. They're in the NICU long-term, a lot of learning disability issues, high medical expenses. So our ultimate goal is to really move the needle to get as many premature babies to full-term babies and to get as many what we call pre-viable babies into the viability. So it's going to be a pathway that we're going to have to do in parallel. So I think you answered then the 22 to 24. You're comparing apples to apples, not just long-term, you know, full-term babies. You're talking stretch, that same group of 22 weeks is the same group that you're talking 24 weeks that uh, you believe would... Um, be viable at that at that point. Yes, but we need to spend more time on this, and that's why you'll see in our work plan, um, working closely with the NICU doctors, high risk OB doctors, and families that have experienced the loss to see if there's any other pieces of the puzzle we are missing. But we do think there's going to be a social piece to it, in addition to a medical piece to move the needle on this issue. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Chair. Sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for being here this afternoon. Thank you. Um, you, you know, I, I think you. I think I don't, I don't know what word you use, but it's not. It's not like a pretty subject to, to be talking about. But certainly, I mean, I mean, I'm of the opinion that you know we should get this as low as possible. No baby should die. Um, so, you know, what what do we do? There's a there's a lot going on here, and you're mentioning um, you know, like a, the racial disparity. Obviously, that's a problem. When you when you talk about like structural um, uh, disparity, or I'm sorry, what'd you use? Structural racism. St structural racism. Could you give me an example of of that, just in a practical, um, from from a practical standpoint of a, of a young African woman going to a, a, a medical facility, for example? Sure. Um, I guess I'll take an example from New Orleans, which I spent some time with them. And then maybe an example here. So in New Orleans, they were looking at the issue of structural racism. And what they wanted to do is train their staff to look at biases that are on, um, they're below the conscious. You don't realize um, they're impacting. 
And so they did that work for about three years. And what they did find is there was some biases about getting into appointments or some biases of the treatment based on the person's name, voice, or actual interaction with the doctor. And so we are wanting, and our hospitals are joining on this in looking at that. Are there biases not only in the issue of our healthcare system, but within the issue of our housing? Um, I've been spending a lot of time with Jeff Patterson over at CMHA. We want to also look at within the education system. So I think it's just what barriers are there? And I think Racial Equity Institute, and we hope if you haven't attended, you'll join First Year Cleveland when we'll be investing time and some talent into attending, is talking about what policies do we have, like redlining of housing and others, that are not only impacting that individual, but is actually having a direct impact to our maternal and um, child health outcomes. So we still have a lot to learn on this topic, but we are very pleased pleased that this community is ready to address this and look at how policies and day-to-day -day practices um, could be impacting and that we could do better if we could address these head-on and in an honest dialogue and looking at it. So the hospitals are looking at training programs to see if there is some unconscious bias, that we correct those unconscious biases. We are looking at policies that um, could be impacting unintentionally for this issue. Um, but we've had um, mothers share their experiences through the housing systems, employment systems, and others that they feel there was um, barriers to how they were treated versus other people treated. And that that extra stress and the ability to navigate it when they were pregnant put maybe undue stress. Pregnancy itself is a stressful time, but it added to that. And when you're having it every day, every week, every month, every year, for decades, how that could be impacting their actual bodies and their actual outcomes. Um, so. Sure, if I could follow up. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so have, have uh, you guys taken any steps to deal with any of the uh, local hospitals with respect to training or yep. sensitivity programs or something like that, yep. just so there's an awareness. Because you said it's it's not like an overt; it's an it's a underlying bias that people might have when someone maybe calls up and says, "What's your insurance, Medicaid?" And oh, okay, another handout for this person. You know, I'm you know yep. people people unfortunately. You get that sometimes. No, I think you're nailing it, that, <clears throat> um, that unconscious. And the answer is yes. So you'll see um, several things in our action plan that we have. And one is making sure we're all aware of this and what policies could. And what we're asking is 45 system leaders, including this group, to join us to go to Racial Equity Institute. Mm -hmm. They have been in town here for about a year. It is a two-day training. Begin connecting the dots of local policies, state policies, and federal that could be tying into structural racism. Mm -hmm. And having us all find the words and the experiences and to hear different experiences. So I think that's a piece of the work. I'm very proud to say that the hospitals are taking a lead with this. Their diversity officers at the hospitals are looking at training and um, creating measurements for First Year Cleveland, thinking through. Um, they have been phenomenal. You can only imagine bringing this topic to people's mind. It makes people sometimes nervous. Yeah. Hospitals, like, if you think we could be doing anything better and we have any unconscious biases that could be impacting the baby's dying, we're in, right. hands on. We are there. We will even use our own funding. Um, but let's get all the hospitals together. Let's pick you know, a similar training group. Let's um, move this forward together. So I am thrilled. We want to do the same with housing. We want to do the same um, with other systems because you have to actually have all the systems kind of working together to actually get the large community impact we're wanting. We all know that the tie-in of a strong mom, baby, and dad is tied in way before they get pregnant. I mean, the best part is get everyone healthy when they're in childbearing mm -hmm. years, and we're going to have better outcomes when they choose to get pregnant. So we're starting right now where the crisis is, but we do want to go downstream and begin addressing this issue. Mm -hmm. um, but it is at the same time we really have to address sleep-related deaths. That is preventable. We um, hosted Baltimore. Be More Baltimore has had actually the best gains in this issue. They went from um, an average of 29 sleep-related deaths for almost 15 years. They are now to down to five. 
right. sleep-related deaths. And so your funding and your leadership is going to be critical in providing us the ability to replicate when we can across the country and then create anything unique for us to move this needle. But sleep-related, we're as passionate to. You almost have to do three things around the same time with focus and strategy and outcomes to be able to get us where we need to go. Right. So on, uh, if I could, Madam Chair. As far as the sleep-related deaths, again, completely preventable, you know. Um, so is there an education campaign or something out there? Because, again, I mean, it's tough enough just being a young parent uh, to, you know, and you, you, know, you, you try to follow and then you got your, like your mom and your grandma. I never did that or this is, you know, I didn't use a car seat or what. Yeah, you get that stuff. I'm not saying my parents are. But, uh, but, uh, <laughs> Where did you sleep? <laughs> I'm in big trouble here. Sleep? <laughs> but uh, but um, so, so it is about educating people and letting people know, you know, very strictly that if you, you know, if, if you don't follow this, these, these rules or what we tell you in place, there's a very good chance that something bad could, could happen. Um, um, so is there, there is a campaign out there or you plan on continuing with that? Because I think that's very important. Yes, I think you, um, public awareness and education is key. You will see in our plan to continue to join the Ohio Department of Health, who put several million dollars together on a campaign. What I am asking you is to stretch your imagination and go that next step. So when we look at, in 216, the babies who passed away of sleep-related death, and there was 20 of them that were from all parts, many that you guys represent here um, and your colleagues, that every one of them knew the ABCs. Every one of them had a crib, pack and play, or a box. So what we're calling for is to continue the public awareness. It is critical. It is now by law. The hospitals have to discuss the ABCs before discharge. Um, you're seeing all of your home visitors, and you probably know this, you have 300 home visitors for pregnant moms going out to all your neighborhoods and reaching out and reinforcing that message. It's reinforced in prenatal care. But why hasn't that moved the dime? The actual state started in 1978, their first campaign on um, the ABCs. So we've known ABCs for a long, long time. The beauty is parents can repeat it. So in my opinion, we have saved babies because of the public awareness and education. Our number would probably be higher. Now it's time that the public awareness people continue their important work, but we got to go the next step further. And it's some behavioral modification program. We need to take people that are educated on the topic how to change a behavior. We have to understand what it will take to change a behavior. What we've been looking at is who's done this best nationally. You'll see two. MAD is the perfect example, Mothers Against Drunk Drivers. They have taken a movement to actually do behavioral modification, but not typically their target has not been the actual person driving, it's the people around them. My kids will never remember a time that when you see someone at a party drinking, you don't take their car keys away, you don't call Uber, you don't do everything. They just could never envision a time. We want that same with sleep related. We want as many guardian angels around that grandmothers, um, babysitters, your early learning childcare, everyone can influence and remind the mother about um, the importance of the ABCs. I'll bring out a perfect example. My little daughter's 13, um, and she actually was babysitting about two months ago. Because of this job, she's been to a lot of weekend baby showers, ABC stuff, and she was watching a newborn baby and a three-year-old, and the mother was downstairs. And the three-year-old ran into the baby's room. My daughter ran after her, and she noticed the baby was not following the ABCs. So she moved the baby, took the blankets out, and went down to talk to the mom. And the mom did not know about the ABCs, which I'm shocked. She clearly didn't follow them. And then from there, thanked my daughter. But what happens if every first, second, third, fifth, seventh, eighth graders, all of our high schools know the ABCDs and helps motivate it? Um, we are looking at a campaign to actually motivate all of us um, to follow the ABCs and to actually almost like mad that we are definitely going to spend time with the mothers, but where are the guardian angels of this community? 
I think we could get a million guardian angels that can make sure that when the mom's not following the ABCDs, for a variety of reasons, she's exhausted, she fell asleep when she was feeding the baby, that the people that are caring and kind of in and out of that household can assist in helping her and families that are isolated, that we can have guardian angels stop in, seeing how they can help and bring out a difference. So you will see... Um, uh, Metro Hospital started the first ever that I can find around the country employee guardian angel kind of ABCD. So they offer to all of their employees if they would like to volunteer on their own time, they would get trained as being a sleep ambassador. And then from there, they asked whenever they're visiting friends, whenever they're shopping, whenever they're just in their own neighborhood, spending their um, churches, temples, that they continue to kind of preach the ABCDs. Why don't we have all employees? Key Bank, I think, is looking to get active. Others that I really could see us all marching. You'll hear soon from Michael, because it's his turn up pretty soon, that um, the faith-based is going to play a huge role in, um, I think, saving babies' lives through sleep-related deaths. I don't think we've used this faith base as strategically and that this will be the time to, I think, get everyone at the table. But we hope your own employees will all get trained and be kind of ABC guardian angels and that whenever they're interacting um, throughout not only their jobs, there's a lot of county workers going into the home separate from our home visitors program. As you know, my, both children are foster to adopt children from the county system, and so I wish when my workers were in that they were talking to me about the ABCs. At the same time, they were talking to me about other safety issues. We have a lot of seniors that have people coming into their homes from the county and the city. What happened if all those workers are just double checking to make sure the ABCs are being followed? So I think we could galvanize everyone in a really cool way. Um, I know our time is limited, so I do want to talk a little about Medicaid, and we can't thank Matt Carroll and others enough that brought $4.9 million into Medicaid, and we cannot thank Case enough who is managing Medicaid grants are complex at best, and they are going out to grassroots agencies that offer us um, the right way to um, move the needle, but also offer some uniqueness in contracts and other things. You do have on your... Um, in your package, if you can pull out the listing of all the Medicaid, $4.9 million that was brought to the table here. We have some exciting programs, but probably one of the most exciting is what we're doing with the faith base. And Michael, I was hoping you could come up, introduce yourself, and talk a little about the faith base. Good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair, other members of uh, the committee. I'm Michael Hauser. I'm a special assistant to our chief of staff. I'm speaking on behalf of Pastor Fred Knuckles this evening and just want to tell you a little bit about what we're doing with the faith-based uh, community. As Bernie mentioned um, and many members of clergy wanted me to stress that they have already been doing this work for some time now and so uh, we are trying to make sure we strategically get people to the table so we can make a concentrated effort to really reduce uh, infant mortality all around Cuyahoga County. Uh, we believe that the faith-based community has a very unique and powerful opportunity to really make an impact on infant mortality. As many of you guys know, um, faith-based institutions are a trusted voice in many communities. They uh, can engage many members of the community. And so uh, we have a list is in you guys' packet. We're going to engage 44 churches. Um, how we pick these churches, we um, basically looked at the highest rates of infant mortalities around Cuyahoga County, and we uh, strategically uh, pick these churches and and in the program we're gonna um, allocate a health minister um, we're gonna use uh, some money we have a hundred thousand that we're gonna split evenly I think each church is gonna get a little more over two thousand and um, this is for their health minister the health minister is gonna engage uh, new mothers mother inspecting uh, fathers teach them about the ABCs of safe sleep um, they're gonna do programs as well as uh, give sermons about infant mortality and, and the importance of infant mortality. And so um, um, this the, the money for these health ministers, it will cover a host of events, food, materials, and other things related to the program. And so, um, again, we think we have a very uh, unique way, um, even back to an example that uh, Councilman uh, Tuma uh, gave. So if you have a mother who let's say doesn't have a car, but if she heard about uh, this program or something in church, she can easily contact her church, her health minister, 
Um, the self minister can actually pick her up or take her to the hospital if she needs services, um, maybe stay with her even if they have to uh, miss some time at work. Hopefully the stipend can help cover that. And so we really want to be strategic and, and get our health community involved. Again, they have already been doing this work, and so if we can support them as a county, um, as First Year Cleveland, then we are uh, more than happy to do that. Uh, Mr. Hauser, can you get this information back to us and break these 44 churches into districts, which which um, I'm looking at many of them, but uh, is that is that yep, a possibility? Yep. Okay, and also, uh, out of these 44 churches that will that you stated, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, are already receiving, are already doing some sort of things like this in their churches, but this will just enhance it, this first Cleveland uh, grant funding. Correct. So they will be, they will receive funding. Um, is that, how is that determined which church gets what amount? Um, so each church gets, gets the same amount. Um, from my understanding, and Bernie, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but we're going to give uh, half of it up front, and this is just to get started with the program. And then um, we have uh, things that we want completed. And so once uh, they have completed, uh, let's say, a sermon or um, enrolled or, or speak to um, X amount of people, then, we're, um, then we'll, when we feel satisfied that they have completed the program, we're going to uh, give them the remainder of the money. And so a lot of these churches have volunteered. Again, a lot of these churches are, are doing this work. And so uh, as a county, we just want to be a resource. So when you say um, out of the funds, mm -hmm. they will get half of the funds. Are you talking about the million point five? Uh, no. So this is a $100,000 program. Uh, 84, I do believe, came from first year Cleveland and then Medicaid. From the state, and then um, another sixteen from first year Cleveland. So total total amount that the churches will split is what a hundred thousand, right. and that's a little more over um, two thousand to each church. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. Hauser? Please continue, Mr. Hauser. Um, that's all I have. Okay. Thank you. Um, just a reminder there, this is a pilot. We'd like to grow our faith base, what the value add is. As Michael said, many of the churches, Temple Moss, have been doing work on um, infant mortality. But the value add here is two. One, they are getting trained by the Cuyahoga County Board of Health on the, um, the sleep-related information. So it's a more formal training to make sure um, they have all the facts and to um, talk a little about, and we talked about it here, that this is changing behavior. And so how to discuss with someone that the grandmother says, I always put the baby down this way, um, why all of a sudden are you asking a different way? So we want to make sure everyone is database trained with the facts. And so that's the important here. We would like to grow this program um, so we get a lot more people involved in the faith base. So this was a pilot. The um, Medicaid has asked us to look at what would this look like if we expanded it out to the entire county. And so we're looking at that. We do think this could be a really um, great way to use the strengths and leverage um, the voices and the influence, um, formal and informal, um, in this community. Ms. Kerrigan, who is um, paying for the training for the church? Sure. Um, the County Board of Health is actually volunteering to do that free of charge. Um, that's the beauty of First Year Cleveland is we're asking members to bring their time, talent, and treasures to the table. And so they are donating their time, all their training material. That's the leverage of one plus one getting us three or four versus and, two. And so I know this is a pilot program in regards to the churches. If there are some more that want to come on board um, later on, will they still be offered that um, free training from the County Board of Health? And how would that um, look in terms of getting, um, I guess, some funding from this uh, contract? Yes, I think you um, nailed 
that you have to get these to scale. So I think with this pilot, we're interested to hear from the pastors what was a value add to this program, and then we do want to continue that value add. In what was a barrier or just didn't work, it was our best thinking. This has been driven by um, Pastor Knuckles and Pastor Phillips, so this was some of their best thinking with the County Board of Health in first year Cleveland. Um, we'll learn from this and then be able to expand it. So I can't tell you today what key elements will be in the future future one, but I will tell you we're committed for faith base to play a key role in um, stopping our babies from dying. We think they have a unique asset that we have not leveraged and maximized. Okay, so I'm just looking at the churches that are involved at a glance, and um, that's why I want to put in, put it, get them put into districts, but uh, is there a map um, what does this map show? Is this map of Cuyahoga County, basically? That is the, the map deaths. of Cuyahoga County in so the So it looks like it touches Wesley. You, you, know, you see where I'm saying? Yep. It, you have dots all over. And looking at the um, the churches, it's not matching up with... And that, and that's the reason that I brought it up. No, is, it's an excellent you know, question. How we decided to do it at this point was Medicaid gave us eight hot zip codes in 215 based on Medicaid losses. It was before we started the strategic plan, understanding that this was broader than just Medicaid, but it did give us the ability to go to those zip codes. So these zip codes are by the 215, and I can send you a copy of the 215 hot zip codes directed by Department of Medicaid, but you are correct that this is touching many more than just those hot spots, and so we will be broadening it out after this pilot. Okay, would that, would that be probably, possibly with an increase of, of that million point five that's before us today? You would need more to do that, right? Right now we are looking at um, developing um, our final plans. Right now it matters how far we want the whole pilot to scale at what time period. This um, using your current 1.5 does allow us to invest an additional 100,000 in 218 to expand the faith based project. Um, if we want to go larger than that from lessons learned, um, we do have other funders at the table that would be interested to leverage your dollars. Okay. Um, because when I first heard about infant mortality or, you know, or I'm not going to say first heard, but got involved. I guess the county got involved in, um, in infant mortality. You know, I always, you've got to be able to get this funding into the individuals that are having the babies. I mean, you just, if not, you're wasting money. It's my opinion. And so um, I like this uh, faith-based initiative, you have it at the hospitals, uh, bright beginnings, those kind of, yes, you'll is see it that already happening investing. or something that we have to do? No, we're already investing in your seven home provider um, programs, bright beginnings, Moms First is your largest one. We have Omri, who has a new name, I wish I would remember it, I think it's Moms and Babies First. Um, you have birthing um, beautiful communities, and you also have the new nurse family partnership. Um, so to be honest, what we're trying to do is how to leverage the 300 community health workers with the faith base, with the hospitals, and that's, we just haven't had that connection. Everyone's doing great work, but unless we kind of put it all together and then see, like you heard, the health department doing the training to the faith base, but the faith base can go out and do outreach for them, that's where we'll start maximizing. And it's just beginning. I mean, we have just been going for about nine months, but we've seen some great progress, and now that we have a strategic plan, I think it's going to be very clear. Before, when people would ask to do something, there was no way to say what fits fits in and what doesn't, what will leverage us or not. Now we have a roadmap to say if that leverages this roadmap, beautiful. We'll want to get your money out quickly. If it doesn't, we'll explain why and see if they'll jump on board or stay strategic on what we're working on. Okay, I'm gonna let you continue, Ms. Kerrigan, but sure. do you have the uh, do you have a breakdown uh, in the county um, for which in, in districts which where we've had the majority of deaths? I, I can see the dots, but just to uh, is that we can get that, that you for can... your district. Thank we you. We can break it out by district. Thank you. Definitely. Yes. 
Um, in trying to digest some of the numbers that you've been giving us, um, in trying to get a handle on all babies born, and then coming up with perhaps some percentages of where we need to concentrate our efforts, it looks like under your the problem why our babies are dying, um, 126 babies no longer with us, 67, 22, and 13. That's 102 of your 126 that fall into that category. So the sleep-related, which is from your prior testimony, can be from the very healthiest of babies. So that, to me, seems to be a completely different category than the 67, 22, and 13 from extreme prematurity, birth defects, and infectious medical issues. Those are, those are where it seems to me where the emphasis needs to be. And not to say that it's not important, but, you know, 20 out of the 126, which leaves, you have homicide and four others here of undetermined, I just question why we would put so much emphasis on the 20 for sleep-related, given that's an educational piece. Many other organizations are doing this. It's a high importance, easily preventable. Um, I don't know why we would not perhaps shift most of our emphasis on the um, prematurity first. And birth defects, I'm not quite sure what needs to be done in that category. And then uh, medical causes, that's a whole nother family history. You know, perhaps there's not anything we can do if it's something that's hereditary. So um, when we're talking about putting money into places where we want to get the best results yeah. for the most vulnerable, it would seem to be the prematurity would be the number one emphasis. And steering money away for other reasons may not be the best, perhaps, um, way of spending our resources. It's an excellent question, and I think um, the committee itself and the overall members of the committee really tackled with that question of where do you start first and what do you have to do first. Um, let me tell you kind of how we landed where we landed um, on it. So birth defects. We've been working very closely with March of Dimes. We have one of the lowest per rate of births. You take your um, births, the 14,625, to our birth defects. We are one of the lowest. So there's not much lower we can get. It does not mean research is not going to occur. Um, March of Dimes does put in millions of dollars each year to that research. There's other researches on a federal, national level of research. But really when we push what role could we play in birth defects and where were we benchmarked with other cities similar to us, there was really no needle to move. Does it not mean that any of our messages about folic acid, I mean, we've had people say, if your kids are getting married, that should be your wedding gift to them, that start folic acid early, and that um, that could play a key role in March of Dimes, we do. There are places we need to lead, and there's places we need to follow. Birth defects is going to be an area that we should follow. One, it is significant dollars. Your dollars would be wiped away very, very, very quickly and maybe a small return on investment. There will be some changes medically in this area, but with us benchmarking so well in having a lead agency of March of Dimes and others, um, after a lot of good dialogue and some tough thinking through, um, First Year Cleveland shows to assist in that area. You'll see them in our work plan, um, but not to lead and not to invest your dollars. The same with infections, perinatal complications, and other medical causes. When we um, compare us to uh, the other cities in Ohio and across the country, we are actually very good in this number. So again, can it improve? Yes, and some of that may come out with some of our work um, of working with the hospitals on some of the out other outstanding issues of training um, and biases or unconscious biases, but that was probably for the cost of what you could do was not the best place to um, look at your dollars. So then we did meet with Baltimore when they could convince us that when they got everyone together, really understanding and starting to change behavior and awareness, and that we could move this needle, if not down to five, darn close to it, 
in that it took them about a year of making some significant system changes to make that. I think um, it is a very wise um, investment for us to do and to stick with it. But you are correct. You will not move the infant mortality rate from where it is today to the 6% where we want it with only a sleep related. You have to begin tackling the premature and it's gonna be the hardest because they are no longer the babies born at 27, 28, 29, 30. That's where your prematurity number was. Your prematurity number in the past 25 years didn't have these pre-viable. Moms had miscarriages at home, and then unfortunately, but they did not get birth and death certificates. We are in a different day now that the majority, if you look at your even your um, 217 numbers, 50% of our infant mortality rate is based on pre-viable deaths. And so far, um, 17P is the only medical prevention. We looked at every record in 216 um, 215 and 216. If these were moms with no prenatal care, a lot of drug and alcohol, we'd do a whole different intervention. These are moms that had high medical compliancy, wanted a child, but lost a child during pre-viable. So there is gonna have to be a medical prevention, but where do we tie in? All of our home visitors are being trained on December 1st at the Center for Families and Children's, if you can join us, on what 17P is. Because as many people, our faith-based is being trained October 30th, um, and they will learn about 17P. You know why? When I was one of our focus That's groups, one of the uh, moms that heard about progesterone thought it was estrogen and said, I would never take that. I don't want breast cancer. And I said, estrogen and progesterone are different. Progesterone could make a difference. She's had two losses within the last 14 months of babies around 18 weeks. This is the best medical prevention we can offer her right now. Hopefully there'll be more coming, but I don't see it down the pike at least for the next couple of years. And so making sure we're on the right page, giving pregnant moms who desperately want to have a child um, to have all the medical advice possible, we need to make sure the WIC people know what it is. We need to, and they accurately know what it is. We need our home visitors. We need our um, faith-based leaders. So it's getting information out that is correct so a pregnant mom and the expected dad can make the best decision. But we had, and you are correct, I mean, we looked at this long and hard because we had to think of where to really put our time, talent, and treasure that will leverage this. And to our best understanding from the data we have right now, we feel moving the dime on racial disparities, extreme prematurity, and preventable sleep is the best way for this community to get this number down and hold it down. We've been notorious of going down one year and smack up and even higher the next. I'm gonna quickly move us on that there was no way First Year Cleveland could have done all this work without Matt Carroll and um, City Council President Kevin Kelly that actually had the groups all going before I was hired. And thank you, Matt, for all your hard work and leadership. And then Case Western Reserve was picked as the fiscal agent before I was um, hired. I'd like to thank them for their amazing work and everything they're bringing to the table and have them come up, introduce themselves, and share a little about the expenses, where we've been spending your dollars, and what we plan next. Feeding day. Thanks, Marty. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and committee members. Thank you for having us here today. I'm uh, B.D. Lippman. I am at the School of Medicine. Um, I'm Senior Director for Government Relations and Strategic Initiatives. Um, Dr. Michael Constant is um, head of our leadership team, and I'll have Dave Salvaggio introduce himself. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here today. One of his patients, uh, a family member, passed away, so he uh, was unable to attend, but planned to. He was former chair of pediatrics at Case Western Reserve and the University Hospitals, and now is in a leadership position at the School of Medicine overseeing community programs, uh, including um, um, our partnering with First Year Cleveland and the city and county to launch First Year Cleveland. So again, his apologies for not being here. Um, Dave, you want to introduce yourself? And then yes, we'll uh, I'm uh, Dave Salvaggio. I'm the Administrative Director for Pediatrics at the School of Medicine. I'm also assigned to help uh, on the First Year Cleveland project. Um, and I think we can sure. just look at the in last your page of the on report. Page five. There are a couple of pie charts to give you an, a, um, a 
feel for the spending that's occurred and what will we project to have happen. Um, so since May of 2016, when we, we began, um, we have spent a total of $424,000 um, and about 47% of that's provided as in kind by CWRU. That, uh, that represents um, the time that Dr. Constan, Beattie, mm -hmm. okay. and I spend uh, space, other resources, uh, human resources, legal, um, you know, throughout the university, which um, normally are captured and covered by indirect costs or overhead charges, which we, we don't uh, absorb in this, uh, in this center. Another area is marketing and communications is very engaged in this um, uh, launch, if you will, for first year Cleveland and getting the word out there. Oh, Here. sorry. Uh, marketing communications is another department that's been very, very engaged uh, with Bernie and myself in terms of um, helping build the roadmap in terms of its website, communications, press releases. So those are all kind of rolled into this as well. And access to our experts at the School of Medicine, both clinical and research, as well as the, our affiliate um, uh, hospitals that also work with us and partner with us. Uh, so the the fifty three percent of the spending that you see on the chart is uh, has been uh, forwarded by forward funded by uh, CWRU, um, and you know will be repaid once the the uh, con contract is finally executed. Um, just going back to in kind, you see where we make a note that this in kind contribution was one hundred percent higher than originally estimated, and I think that's because um, for two, two main reasons. The, we got started and started moving faster than was expected, and then we had success with getting Medicaid dollars come in, um, you know, right away and have moved that out to the community as soon as possible. So both of those things um, made the resources needed go up. So we view that as a good thing. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, for the next, for the entire period of time, how do we look at the spending? Um, when we look at the $2 million, the 1.5 from the county and 500000 from the city of Cleveland, and in addition, project forward what the in-kind might be uh, uh, conservatively, uh, we're talking about a $2.4 million spend by the end of 2018. Um, I think I in think terms, I'd like to talk about the breakdown. We'd like to make sure, and we work closely with Bernie on this, um, and the executive committee and the advisory council, but we want to make sure funds get out into the community. So you'll see of that 2.4, 1.6, we hope at a minimum we'll get out to initiatives in the community that Bernie talked about today. Um, and then it shows mm -hmm. distribution in terms of um, what we provide case uh, for operating support, day-to-day -day operations, and then also general operating uh, for first year Cleveland. Do you have any questions? And so you have a um, breakdown, Ms. Litterman? Litman. Litman. Uh, 1.6. Um, you want to go back, and I'm, I'm taking we're talking about the 2.4 million. You want 1.6 to go back to community initiatives, and then the remaining will pay for administrative costs? General operating, yes. And these are best projections, and we, uh, Bernie and I, are working on an annual plan right now. Uh, we'd be happy to come back perhaps in six months and provide you with a detailed operating budget. Mm -hmm. um, Any other questions from uh, council members? Councilwoman. Thank you. Um, I'm not quite sure I, I understand here the, the first yellow circle. Mm -hmm. County, city supported expenses of 226000 and then 198000 and that was spent up till today, September 2017. That's right. So um, I guess I didn't hear what was that spent on? Five, wh what do you have to show for the 
24000 or almost $425,000. What is in place today that was spent? And I believe, I wasn't here last year, but I believe there was $1.5 million from the county that has not been touched yet. This is probably part of that. But where, I'm, I guess I'm, if you can explain a little bit about the um, money that was spent to date and what you have in place, perhaps to get you on the ground running, or if more expenses have to be uh, put into this circle, we can see this perhaps increasing before you get off the ground running. Can you okay. just kind of tell well, me where? Uh, Beatty can chime in, but um, you know we have we have an executive director who has been on board since last December. We have had um, temporary help and soon to um, hire uh, full time other staff that are part of the plan. We have um, office space. We have support of all the entities that we talked about earlier, legal, you know, all the internal resources of Case Western. And then we have dedicated effort of um, the three of us, Beatty, myself, and Dr. Constant. So all those things together, you know, constitute the full pie. So if, if I can expand a little bit on the county city supported expenses, uh, if you review the uh, MOU that was executed between the city of Cleveland, Cuyahoga County, and I Case for yes. first year Cleveland, um, the funding uh, pays the salaries for first year Cleveland staff members. We are not first year Cleveland staff members, so we fall into the in kind category. Up to 25% of my time can be dedicated to this initiative. So it's significant in terms of our time allocation. I think Dave, you're 10%, Dr. Constant is 5%. We have an, uh, an assistant that we have allocated like 5% of her time. But again, on the uh, county city side, so it's for any salary expenses for first year Cleveland uh, staff, and that will be increasing very soon with two more uh, uh, fairly high level positions, two senior directors. Uh, there's also meeting expenses in there. We provide meeting space at no cost. That's in kind, but um, there are some food costs for off-site meetings. Uh, and there a are strategic some supplies. planning consultant. We had a consultant for the strategic planning process that uh, we did receive approval. I think that was thirty thousand uh, dollars for that. So there have been some consulting costs. Um, and again, we can provide you with the detailed uh, the line items for that if helpful. Let me follow. Mm -hmm. The um, so it from May 2016 to September 2017. It's been about 16 months, mm -hmm. and that is for the most part been an organizational time. Sounds like hiring directors, your support staff, office space. So I but guess also program time. I'm sorry. Okay, so I, I guess that's where I'm going to go. Is okay. how much more is this? all related to the expenses for organizational or where do we start to see although i do see you have execute you um, execute the strategic plan starting well you have it starting in may 2016 so do you have for us what programs have been in place on the ground working engaging or are you not there yet uh, if you refer to the listing for the MedTap funding, okay. uh, throughout this first year, and actually right after we signed the MOU almost, we initiated contracts with five MCOs in the state uh, for the Medicaid dollars. We then initiated contracts with multiple agencies that, again, are listed on that table. So we hit the ground running, if you will, in terms of, and Dave mentioned that previously, that things took off very quickly without having infrastructure that is an executive director. Um, I think if we counted up all the contracts, there were probably 20 plus related to these uh, programs. Uh, we had to get those launched. We had to put out, uh, we requested proposals with statements of work and budgets. And so it's a pretty exhaustive process. It's not just obviously uh, uh, sending out the money. We've got to make sure that there's a credible program in place that they've got deliverables and metrics which are required by Medicaid. So that was a significant amount of work and that's ongoing. There was a second award uh, with an anticipated third award coming uh, sometime in 2018. So it, that's, it's, a, it's very labor intensive in terms of uh, human capital. If I may just 
finish. Uh, so when do you expect, or maybe you have already, when do you expect those infrastructure type of organizations that you've taken the 16 months to kind of put together, and when do you expect, expect to launch, or have you already? When do you expect to say, we've reduced these uh, infant mortality rates by this number because we have in place these programs that are working? Where are you on that timeline of what it is that you're doing? Well, right now we've got two things in place. One is that with the Medicaid funding, they pre-selected prior to the strategic plan where the funds would go. Um, so that's one trajectory with specific metrics that Medicaid uh, has designed. And then we also have the strategic plan kind of in parallel with that um, where again, we're focusing on three priority areas that are consistent with Medicaid, but also looking at best practices. Uh, Medicaid funds went to expand, for the most part, current existing programs. And with Bernie's leadership, we'll be able to coordinate and align and connect all these programs uh, moving forward. But Medicaid really um, dictated in terms of where the money would go and how it would be spent. But we're tracking metrics. We present uh, quarterly reports to Medicaid in terms of uh, those outcomes. Those outcomes do not include necessarily seeing a reduction of a certain percent, but rather touching a certain percent or a certain number of mothers in the community and increasing capacity at that, at that point. But the goal is to hit, um, it reduce uh, the infant mortality rate and hit the national uh, uh, goal uh, in 2020 of, I think, 6%, right, Bernie? 6%. Yeah. And outside, if I may continue, outside of the Medicaid funding mm -hmm. that you've been able, and they're pretty, and they're in place, they're yes. doing this with or without you, they're, they're already engaged in making sure that the resources are there for, for those in need. F putting that aside, where do you start to get engaged with new... Um, funding and activity and you know when we see you again mm -hmm. sure. this is what we I mean Medicaid is is good you're right. engaged that's great but what we're talking about here is above and beyond that right when do we hear we have this in place that in place we reduced it by this much because of our interaction sure let me um, interject there I guess because I want to make sure I don't think we're all on the same page Medicaid definitely gave this community 4.9, but it was the work of First Year Cleveland and many agencies. I'm meeting these programs monthly with data. What's going on in your neighborhood? What are we seeing? What are we seeing from the hospitals? So if you look on page 20 of our strategic plan, um, Appendix B, these were very... Um, What's the right word? It's the value add you bring to the table. And so you will see, let's give an example, Birthing Beautiful Community started up in 214, an amazing program that is serving about 115 pregnant moms and showing at this time no infant deaths. What they have learned, I can pass on because we meet now collectively of all the home visitors. We're learning for the first time. Medicaid never brought these guys together to know, say, what's the value add? Someone's struggling with this. Somebody's not able to get in here. Somebody's not able to do something. That's the value add. So I guess I look at it a little differently, that typically there's not this much in kind that CASE is doing or in kind that we're having all the community partners doing. But for your two, um, 226196 over the last um, May 216 to September 217, what did you get? For the first time, you are seeing live data on infant mortality. You used to see that in a lag time of approximately 18 months. You have seen the faith-based community talk about their strengths with their opportunities and finding the right path for them, which is the sleep-related death. You have your home visitors actually creating a vision of, I don't know if we need to add 300 more, but are we strategically um, getting the right women that will benefit from home visiting programs. We have nurse home visitors. We have doula home visitors. We have community health workers. Which one model is the best for 
the family, um, the individual, and now we're coordinating all of that that has never been done before. You're bringing for the first time together 240 agencies that are actually lear learning together, sharing best practices. For the first time, we're bringing in Baltimore. We've been able to talk to Denver. Boston would like to come in to talk about their housing and how it has decreased their infant mortality So and research going on. So I guess what's unique to me about this, and I've worked with this community and health and human service very, for 226,000, I've never seen a better bang for the buck. And I think we're then gonna be moving forward to spending more dollars. You'll see in our strategic plan to hire two more staff, um, one that will be playing an instrumental role in reducing the racial disparities, another one playing a key role in the sleep-related deaths. I'll continue to be the point person for the extreme mature, prematurity. So I guess we've been leveraging a lot of dollars, but the value add we've been bringing to the table is looking at, um, it may be slightly different, stop the silos, look at the holistic approach, having learning discussions from agencies that have been working in this space but have never had the opportunity to be brought together. Centering pregnancy, we didn't even touch upon, but there is a whole new way to offer prenatal care. And where does that fit? Um, what negotiations we're doing on Medicaid of rates for that new way to offer prenatal care that is evidence-based that came to our community several years ago and how to leverage um, our relationship. So I think it's the hard part. We're doing so many things at one time. I'm not sure we're telling the story as well as it should be told. But to be honest, your dollars were the first dollars so we could hit the ground running. Not too many agencies that start up and actually have a strategic plan within six months that is data-driven, informed, had focus groups of parents, individuals impacted to this, in addition to the top CEOs of hospitals weighing in, to the grassroots agencies weighing in. Um, and so I think moving forward, we need to continue this urgency. We did see the rates go down in 216. They are lower in 217, but I want to be very cautious. We are not talking about widgets. There are many things that impact. I don't know if there is ever going to be a day we come here and say, because first year Cleveland did this, we got to 6%, but I'm going to be one of the proudest social workers in town when we will be here back in 2020 to say we're at 6% and we were a part of the solution of bringing people together, challenging the way we work challenge the issue about structural racism. There has just not been that good discussion with people impacting on health outcomes. So I guess um, it's a mixture, but it is messy. And I can understand why um, from your end, how we could tell the story in a better way. I think if I could change anything, I would have hired a communications person off top. I mean, we're at so many places doing so many things. What is the message um, and how to make sure everyone stays involved and knowledgeable about this topic? Good. If, if I can just follow, um, so, and that was very helpful. Mm -hmm. I think that was that was really helpful. So, if you are, um, your goal is to value add. Your goal is to take what's already in place, and to target where you think the disparities are and the needs are, and enhance that effort. So yes, you're so not bring people strategically to the table more, like the faith base. They have been doing it on their own, but they've never tied into the Department of Health, then tied into the hospitals and the actual outcomes. So you're correct that our value add is leveraging, um, getting one plus one to equal three or four, and to figure out what the gaps are. And so I think um, we will spend a little more time um, on thinking where the gaps are. Right now, parents are telling us they have a lot of things, but they're working with too many different workers. So I think we're going to see some more coordination and more collaboration um, of our service delivery. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Councilwoman Brown. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, having been a part of this initiative, um, I just want to say I'm very proud of the work that has been done and the research, the focus, the um, resources and time that have been committed to this. Uh, there are difficult conversations that need to be had about systemic issues and the um, racial disparities, which um, impacts the African-American community more so than others. And so uh, I applaud uh, Matt Carroll and uh, Bernie Kerrigan again for their work 
the um, amount of time that has been uh, contributed to this cause from ex experts from actually around the country has um, given us the, um, I would say, the level of expertise to be able to develop a program to leverage these dollars, as, as Bernie puts it, to take one plus one and make four. So um, the only thing that I'm, clear, I'm unclear about is in having uh, taken uh, um, haven't taken a lot of time, and there's still a lot of questions to be answered as it relates to, to the uh, program. But when we were looking at this particular contract, I was under the impression that we used the 1.5 to leverage um, our public partner, public private partnership dollars. So I was wondering if you could tell me the total contract amount and the total money that has been um, collected towards this investment. So I, um, maybe Matt, I know I can share that the 4.9 of the Medicaid, I don't think we would have gotten that level without First Year Cleveland. I think there was something that they were looking and they thought there was a void here. There was too many voices going down to Columbus what to do and they did not tie into data at all. But I'll let Matt, I do know the funders are interested now to get involved now that we have a strategic plan. Uh, through the chair to the councilwoman, that, that was an explicit requirement, basically, that we had a local coordinating entity and when that came through. So we needed that, and that was that's why the rush that BD described. So, yes. Uh, and then uh, I think Bernie and, and our leadership group definitely has a plan to leverage other dollars. Uh, we've been fortunate to have the public support and the, both Medicaid and the county and the city. So that's a key part of the future is having other private support, um, and that's that's in the in the discussion right now. So is it the 1.5 plus the 4.9 million that well, we're working uh, with, or, or is chair, it three Councilor. million that we are contributing on the on the public? So, so just to clarify, just so you know, this is the only 1.5 the county has done. It okay. has not arrived yet, so okay. it's been I think, I think a process with the city to finalize the agreement. Um, but the case has fronted some of the money. Basically, they'll be reimbursed for that that portion. Um, but so it's the Medicaid dollars, almost five million. Okay. It's the city and county at two million. It's what Case has offered. And uh, by the way, we hope there'll be more Medicaid dollars. That's general, you know, message. Uh, we'll see what happens. Um, but then we expect and hope that there'll be private support as well from various sources. Okay, and I think that maybe, and I can't speak for my colleague, but that might answer part of the question that Ms. Baker was relating was was uh, bringing up as it related to the 1.5 million. So this is the initial 1.5 million right. that we authorized back in the original budget uh, right. discussions. Okay, That's right. All right. thank you. Mm -hmm. I'd like to uh, ask a question and for Councilman Miller. Uh, his question was when the county. Uh, when will the county uh, need to put in additional money into the first year program and how much? Uh, Madam Chair and Nurse Committee, uh, that we would like to ask, I think, the opportunity to come back and uh, update council as that goes forward. At this point, you can see there's a plan to, uh, basically goes to the end of 2018 to try to, uh, as far as the current funds go. We, we couldn't really speak to what the future needs will be based on uh, Medicaid variables. I mean, we I think, if this committee is interested, we would be happy to report regularly on the status. And I think as time goes on, we'll be able to answer that question more directly. Uh, we just, we're just speaking to the immediate need right now. Okay, uh, I have a few questions. Um, why wasn't this funding uh, utilized until now or asked to be utilized until now? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, I think again, it was part of the uh, try agreement between case and the city and the county to execute the, the payment um, and again a lot of this process and project and the organization has been you know really rushed to, to get created uh, you know Bernie said we've had a we had a director less than a year uh, and the Medicaid dollars started flowing the infrastructure had to, to be moving so um, you know we're in a position I think now much to better spend the funds that are available uh, obviously a fair question, but, um, you know, I think we have been able to not be sort of constrained by it. With cases support, we've been able to take a lot of action uh, without actually having the funds available, but having them, you know, in the pipeline was, was very important. And does this contract allow for a 30-day out? Uh, I'm not absolutely sure uh, Kelly could speak to that. Uh, yeah, I'm not, not absolutely sure about that. Because most of our contracts have had 30 days out. 
Okay, and then I guess my last question, and we're going to wrap up. Um, does If we don't proceed with this contract at this time, what other allowable uses could this funding be used for? Madam Chair, I, I think that would be the, the Council's uh, direction and decision. Um, obviously, the, the organization has, has sort of hoped for uh, this money to be approved, um, and again, as part of the partnership with the city as well. Um, that wouldn't be my choice to make if that were the case, but there is a, there is a major need. And I, again, we're, I think we're very happy to come back quickly and be more explicit. And as uh, Dave said, and how, you know, how the funding is going to be used and exactly the line items, et cetera. Okay. And, and moving forward, any other questions from the committee? Cause I know we have a few other items on the agenda or right, Mr. Carroll, we're not going to move this contract forward at this time. We would like, um, for you guys to come back at our next council meeting and probably have submit some line items. And we're also going to do our due diligence in terms of uh, a committee because this is kind of like the process here where, you know, we, we fund things and then council is the last to get all the details. And for us to just absorb all this information right now is really not fair to us. <clears throat> so we want to ask that you guys come back in the next two weeks. We'll, we'll, we'll do our due diligence. Uh, ask all the committee members if you have any additional questions in terms of everything that was laid out that we send them probably to Levine and she can kind of like coordinate a list and get that to them so we can make sure that when we pass this or if we choose to pass this that uh, all of our questions are answered because I've got about 10 more and it just will not... <clears throat> not be enough time. So I hope that is uh, good for everybody. Um, I don't know, um, your your office will know if there's going to be any additional case questions, then you guys wouldn't have to come back if they're not. Is that fair? Yes, ma'am. Uh, whatever right. you prefer. Nah, sure. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. We're overwhelmed right now. <laughs> all right. Any miscellaneous business? No miscellaneous business. I'm on. You can't hear me? It's Russ. Oh, okay. Uh, other public comment? Uh, Ms. Lou was signed in. I thought so. Ms. Lou? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh, good afternoon. Sorry. Um, I just heard uh, something very, very serious and important. Unfortunately, homeless issue also is related to that. I'm not sure if these uh, ladies and gentlemen, they understand that. For their research, I'm not sure the data they collected, if they include the people actually in the family shelters. In the family shelters, we have a people with children with all ages, okay? Including toddlers or even infants. Even right now, it's already October, I still see all the homeless families going to Cosgrove for breakfast and intake every day. Because these are the people who cannot even get into a family shelter. They have to stay at a city missions gym every night. So for the research important like this, have you included these people? Yes, let me answer. And how about the service? Will these people receive the prenatal service if the baby is within a certain week? But sorry, we have never seen anybody coming to these places to help these mothers. They are definitely in the category of being very tired, being completely stressed out. But we don't really see too much help on them for this kind of issue, too. We, oh. Apologize. We do not have back and forth. We, no, we, no we I, I just mentioned that. I just wish right. they can hear it. I'm not asking right. them to I'm, answer I'm, now. Right. So I'm just explaining, Ms. Lou, I'm just explaining I it to Ms. Kerrigan because she's new and she doesn't right, right. know. So, so I was it, trying to tell her that I just want her to hear that. I'm not asking her to answer now because that's not the, the thing. I, I know that better okay, than that. Okay, Ms. Lou. So Ms. Kerrigan, if, if you, there is something that you want to respond to in terms of what Ms. Lou states, you could please send that written notice to uh, Levine and then we can make sure that we incorporate that because we want to make sure that... Um, the individuals that come before us get the, get the information that they ask. Go ahead, Ms. Lou. Thank uh, you. 
In the shelter right now, it's under the eight-month contract, but the frontline staff still not really doing their job. Last month, we have this four-month pregnant person getting hit by somebody on her baby. Sure, she was in pain, but nobody actually asked her until several hours later she had asked for 911 call to emergency. In this case, if later her baby will go into that statistic after uh, the baby was born, I mean, uh, will be born, if that's the case, the statistic, I think they should really study more. However, today I'm here for a different issue still related to this particular shelter. Because of the eight month contract, they are not making any effort to make up all the mistakes they made in the past. Originally, I sent in a document, but unfortunately, uh, not enough time to print out for all of you to review right now. You will receive that later, but still, the problem remains. Frontline service is not a service provider county can trust for any kind of contract. That's my point today. Thank you. Madam Clerk, any other additional no, comments? Madam Chair. All right. Um, Meeting adjourned.